Welcome everyone. Uh, I've been asked to introduce uh, Ed Calloway from uh, Salt Institute in San Diego. And uh, Ed did his uh, PhD in Caltech with David Van Essen, doing uh, working on uh, development, right, initially. And then uh, he did a postdoctoral fellow at Rockefeller University with uh, Larry Katz, and Larry Katz was there. And then moved with Larry to uh, Duke, right? And this is actually where our, our stories uh, interact historically because I did my uh, postdoc with uh, Larry uh, 10 years uh, later. And uh, after uh, postdoc with uh, Larry, he got the position initially at uh, Denver and then uh, since 1995 moved to the Salk Institute. And he is there ever since, and he's been a, a full professor since 2006 at Salk Institute and, uh, <coughs> and UCSD. Uh, his CV is uh, clearly, as a Heller uh, lecturer, uh, very, very impressive, many honors, uh, over a hundred uh, papers, many of them are uh, classics. Uh, in the field, he's been working on uh, the development and function of the uh, visual system, especially. And I think what is uh, very special in uh, the work of Ed throughout the years has been the very uh, intricate uh, interaction between uh, the anatomy and the function, both in development and the function. And uh, he has been and he has been, uh, he made uh, several uh, very nice uh, discoveries. Uh, the latest uh, one from uh, 2007 that made a lot of uh, waves is the technique to, for a monosynaptic uh, radius tracing. And uh, of course, uh, many contributions to the structure and function of the visual system using uh, anatomy, physiology, and uh, quite remarkably, both in primates and uh, <coughs> work. Uh, beyond that, we have uh, some mutual grant together that we are sharing with uh, Li Chang and Carl Dasseros, the special uh, Howard Hughes collaborative uh, award thing that uh, Li Chang and uh, Carl are the Howard Hughes investigators and Ed and I are the outsiders. So we've been interacting in the last uh, several years. Uh, in, uh, through this uh, grant as well. So I'm very pleased that uh, you came to visit us and looking forward to the talk. So uh, welcome. Thanks, Alex. The microphone's working. Mm -hmm. right. right. Turn it on. Just before you start, I want to say one word to the audience here. Right now? This is the first of two hour lectures. Okay, you will be in now? The first of two hour lectures, you are most uh, welcome to the second header lecture on Thursday. And we thank the header family for supporting this uh, uh, lectures. We'll talk about it more on Thursday. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Okay. Great. So, yeah, so as Lo was just saying, I'm, I'm going to be giving two lectures. The second one on Thursday. And so that second lecture will be more about the work in the lab on the organization and function of the visual system. And I thought to do something different today, I would focus more on the techniques um, that we've been developing, especially on um, molecular genetic viral approaches. So that will include, toward the end of the talk, the rabies virus tracing technologies that we've developed. Um, at the um, start, uh, so here's an outline of the, the talk. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about why we need better tools than what we had, say, 10 years ago, um, and the need to be able to target specific cell types in the brain, and even to get to levels of resolution that are beyond cell types, even just single neurons. Uh, an individual neuron can be connected very differently than its neighbors of the same type. And um, I, I'll actually um, talk about the actual data that led us to, to see that, because that's a set of experiments, even though it was published, I think, seven or eight years ago, usually uh, people that are computationally oriented find it, find it interesting in some of the specificity of the circuitry that we saw back then. Um, and I, you know, I'm told that there are a lot of computationally oriented people here, so I thought that, that might, might be a good fit. So we'll start off with that, and then I'll 
I'll talk about something that's a little different than what most people think about with using genetic approaches for targeting cell types. And that's motivated by the fact that we actually in my lab do a lot of work on monkeys and we don't yet have transgenic monkeys. So for mice, you can target cell types using transgenic mice, free driver laser. and we do a lot of that <coughs> and I'll talk more about that on Thursday. But um, we've been, de been developing other approaches for targeting cell types that, um, that would work in uh, non transgenic species. And then at the end, uh, as I mentioned, um, I'll talk um, in some detail about how we developed the, um, this monosynaptic rabies virus tracing method, and then also some extensions from that, just depending on how much um, uh, time we have. So, um, so to, to start off with, I, I just wanted to talk about sort of the motivation for needing um, uh, more precise methods to be able to target cell types. And that's sort of illustrated here. And it's important to point out the kinds of things that you would like to do if you want to understand how any kind of circuit in the brain works at any kind of level of resolution. And one step is, of course, to understand the circuit, who's connected to who. But even if you had a complete wiring diagram of the brain, we've had that for C. elegans for many years, we still don't know how the nervous system of C. elegans really works. So that's obviously not sufficient. You need to link connectivity to function in various ways. Um, you need to correlate activity with specific components of the circuitry that are connected in particular ways. And you also need to do causal um, experiments, activating or inactivating neurons. And as you all know, over the last um, decade or maybe even five years, there now exist molecular and genetic tools that allow us um, to do this. Um, but historically, um, we've been able to do this for a very long time at coarser levels of resolution. We've been able to use methods, anterograde and retrograde tracers that you can put into some part of the brain, some visual area, and uh, identify connections uh, um, at this level of resolution, and then make lesions or put an electrode in, um, but not so much uh, at the level of microcircuits. So um, up until say around uh, 2000 when we published this paper, and this is from a little bit more, more recent paper, um, a lot of ideas about sort of microcircuitry in the cortex at least um, assume that if you just filled cells with dye or use Golgi staining, <coughs> you could see where cells have dendrites and where cells have axons, you could figure out a wiring diagram that way. If you just looked at the overlap of dendrites and axons, you could assume that there must be connections. And we started um, back in uh, even before 2000, but we first published this in 2000, using a method that um, I developed when I was in Larry Katz's lab as a postdoc, where in a brain slice we could record intracellularly from a single neuron and bathe the brain slice in caged glutamate. And then when we're recording from this one neuron, which is, of course must be of a particular type, um, you uncage glutamate and that um, causes neurons very close to where you uncase glutamate to fire action potentials. And if they're connected to the cell you're recording from, you see synaptic currents. And so you can stimulate many different locations and make a map of the locations of neurons that provide excitatory input in this case to these cells. And what you can see is that um, for these two cell types, this pyramidal neuron, the fast spiking inner neurons, the pattern of input that you would see is very similar to what you would predict if you just looked at the density of axons coming from each of these locations up to this location. But for other cell types, you see very different patterns. So for example, this cell type doesn't receive uh, connections from layer five, but this cell type receives most of its connections from layer five. So you can infer from this that um, cells that uh, project axons into this layer where all these cells have dendrites can selectively synapse on cell to cell types and not the others. Um, now later, we recorded from any more cell types that we could identify in transgenic mice. But what I wanted to illustrate here is that this is true not only of excitatory connections, but also for inhibitory connections. So here um, are just examples from two of the nine or 10 cell types that we recorded from in this paper. And by changing the holding potential of the cell, you can measure inhibitory or excitatory currents. Um, so here are two different cell types that receive similar patterns of excitatory input. And then on the right here are the patterns of inhibitory input. So you can see that this cell type doesn't receive much inhibition from the deeper layers that this cell type um, does. So inhibitory kind of connections can also be cell type specific. Um, so that's something that you know I, I think is sort of taken as a given now that if we want to understand circuitry in the brain, we need to pay attention to, to cell types. 
But a different level of resolution is illustrated here, and this is a summary from the data that I'm going to um, uh, show that leads to this schematic, where it turns out that um, neurons that are um, uh, next to each other in the cortex are actually only connected to each other, even parietal neurons of the same type, about 10% of the time. But if they're connected together, they share a common input. Um, and I'll, I'm not going to go into the schematic in detail because I'm actually going to show you the experiments that we did to, to demonstrate this. So at the time when we started doing these experiments, we knew that if you just recorded from two neurons right next to each other in a brain flush, say in layer two, three of the cortex, that they would only rarely be connected to each other, 10 or 15 percent of the time. Um, and we um, uh, figured that we could determine uh, whether these neurons shared common input if they were connected or not connected um, uh, using cross-correlation analysis of this photostimulation data, the glutamate engaging that I um, uh, told you about. And the reason that we could do that is that um, if we say, record from two neurons simultaneously, this grid of dots are all the sites where glutamate was encaged. And if you stimulate at a particular site, I told you that neurons there fire action potentials only if they're close by. But it turns out that you stimulate many neurons, probably 30, 50 neurons each time. Um, but the time of the action potentials comes from anywhere from 10 to 50 or even 100 milliseconds after the stimulus. And it's not um, very tightly time locked to the time of the glutamate engaging. So um, you can see here, you record from these two neurons and you, you stimulate, this is 40 milliseconds here, you stimulate right at this point in time, that these two neurons had synaptic currents that were measured in both cells very close together in time. Uh, on, at, following stimulation at this location, they came at different times. And that's because in, in this case, there, the neuron that fired an action potential at this time was connected to this cell, but probably wasn't connected to this cell because these are very reliable connections. About 95% of the time, if there's a connection, you would see a uh, response. Um, so it seems very likely that these two cells share common input that gave rise to these synaptic currents, and that these are different cells providing input in this case. Okay? So um, what you can do then is if you record from two different neurons, um, stimulate all these different sites across the different cortical layers. They're now color coded according to the strength of the input, um, the, the size, and just summing together all the uh, excitatory postsynaptic currents in each site. Um, but what, now what we do is a cross-correlation analysis where we have cell A and cell B, um, and on each trial, you look at the time of the synaptic currents that, that come, and you make a correlogram, and we also make a Shipley correlogram, which corrects for there's a, you can see there's a little bit of a hump there, and that's due to the time locking to the stimulus. Um, but we can subtract that away, and then we can calculate from this peak roughly what proportion of the input to these two neurons is shared, common input. And so we can calculate that separately for the stimulation sites in each layer, layer two, three, layer four, layer five. And you see for this particular cell, now there's this pair of cells there's a big peak in the correlogram, and we estimate that these cells share about 30% of their input in common from within layer 2, 3, 22% from layer 4, and 11% from layer 5. Well, it turns out this is not a typical case. Um, this is a case where the two cell pairs are connected to each other. Uh, the two cells in the pair have a direct connection to each other. It could be reciprocal, but it's usually one way. Um, What's more typical is here where the two cells are not connected to each other, and when they're not connected to each other, now this peak in the parallelogram goes away for the layer two, three, and layer four stimulation sites, but the peak for layer five remains. It's a smaller peak, about 10% of the input that's common from, from layer five. So the layer five input doesn't matter. The, um, the peaks for layer four and layer two, three inputs are only when the cells are connected, not for this uh, unconnected pair. So here across uh, many different pairs, you can see this value that we call the correlation probability, the estimate of the amount of shared input. So for connected cell pairs, you see uh, here the, the reciprocal, we connect pairs of these open circles, um, that when cells are connected to each other, they share lots of common input from layer two, three, and layer four. Uh, but when they're not connected, they don't. Um, 
But then for layer five, it doesn't matter whether they're connected or not. The role of connectivity seems to be a little different. They share about 10% of their input, regardless of whether they're still correct or connected. So that's how we make this sort of cartoon diagram. Um, we say that if shelves are connected to each other, they're more likely to share a common input than if, if they're not. So we call this sort of fine scale specificity of connections, that there are relatively independent subnetworks of neurons embedded with, within the cortex. Okay. Um, we uh, also wondered then whether um, inhibitory connections can be specific on this kind of uh, fine scale, and, um, and also whether inhibitory and excitatory neuron pairs um, share a common input depending on whether they're connected or not, and also on what type of uh, uh, inhibitory cell is involved. So at this time, uh, we weren't able to distinguish very well a lot of the different kinds of inhibitory neurons in the cortex. There are dozens of them. But what we could do is distinguish these fast spiking cells, which express carb albumin, from other cells, which are non fast spiking cells. And the first thing that we saw is that if you simply record from two cells that are right next to each other, one pyramidal cell and one fast spiking cell, again in layer two, three, uh, that uh, the probability that an inhibitory cell connects to the fast spiking cell depends on whether the, I'm sorry, inhibitory cell connects to the pyramidal cell or fast spiking cell depends on whether the excitatory cell connects to that. And that's sort of buried in this histogram here, but really summarized up here. So out of these, I think 43 cell pairs, um, there's in 22 of the 43, about half of the cases, there's no connections at all. In seven of the cases, the excitatory neuron made a connection to the inhibitory neuron. And in seven out of eight of those cases, it's a reciprocal connection 88% of the time. In the other cases where the excitatory neuron didn't connect to the inhibitory neuron, there was a lower probability of the inhibitory connection, only 37%, 13 out of uh, 35. Here. So um, these reciprocal connections are uh, uh, you're, you're much more likely to have an inhibitory connection from a fast spiking cell if it's, if it's reciprocal, that is the pyramidal cell connection. And also it turns out that it's a much stronger connection, the, the inhibitory connection, when it's reciprocal than when it's not. On average, 172 people ounce instead of 54 people ounce. Okay. So this is also a sort of fine scale specificity. Um, we didn't see that for the adapting cells, but there are a lot of different inhibitory cell types that maybe if we did this again, paid attention more and knew more about what inhibitory cell types are recording for, we maybe would see that for a cell, some other cell type. Um, now if we um, do the cross-correlation analysis again, do the basic input maps, um, and now it's a pair of cells, it's a fast spiking cell and a pyramidal cell, in this case a reciprocally connected pair, now again we see this big peak in the correlogram where we see that these two cells share common input from layer four and within layer two, three. Uh, but we don't see it in the cases where the fast spiking cell just makes a one-way connection to the pyramidal cell that's not reciprocal, no peaks in the chorelograms. And again, this is seen across the, the population of pairs. It's only when there's a reciprocal connection, um, not just a one-way inhibitory connection or no connection at all, that you see those peaks in the chorelograms that they're shared common input. So that's then what leads us to add the fast spiking cells to this cartoon in this way, where the fast spiking cells preferentially connect to the same pyramidal cells that excite them. Um, so, um, and, and then also they're then part of the same fine scale um, subnetworks. So this, if you're starting to think about things like how gamma might be involved in, in circuits in the brain, the fast spiking cells generating a lot of the gamma, uh, that there might be <coughs> special populations of pyramidal cells that are wired up to separate independent populations of fast spiking cells that could um, generate gamma differentially for those different populations. So any sort of computational sort of ideas you have about how gamma might work or things um, should probably take that into account. Um, so uh, the, the other thing about this to think about is if we want to link connectivity to function, and one way to do that is we can worry about cell types. And I told you, you might use mouse lines to target cell types or other approaches that I'll talk about later in the talk. That's, that's fine. You can target cell types and find the same cell type from animal to animal. But this level of specificity is probably unique to this particular neuron in this animal. 
the, the neighbors that it happens to connect to create a network, maybe made up from Hebbian learning rules or something like that, um, that's unique. So if you want to link connectivity to function at this level of resolution, you're probably going to have to um, label the circuit in the same animal where you correlate the function of those cells with that particular neuron in the cell that's connected in that same animal. And that's something that's possible to do now with the rabies-based tracing tools that I'm going to talk about. My lab has been doing some of that, but Botan Rowski's lab in Switzerland has been doing some beautiful work doing that um, to directly link um, connectivity to function using the methods that I'll talk about um, uh, in the later part of the talk. Okay. So this, um, what I've said so far, really just, just motivates the need for, for the better methods, but also points up some interesting uh, details about specificity of, of circuits. And back to the same slide where we want to be able to link connectivity to function. You can do that um, at the level of cell types and separate animals, but um, a particular neuron that might be wired up in a unique way, uh, different from the other cells neighboring it of the same type, you're going to have to link connectivity to function in the same animal. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned at the start of the talk, we're now in sort of a new era of neuroscience where at least insofar as we can get genes expressed in cells of interest selectively, we can take advantage of genetic tools for elucidation of neural connectivity, things like the rabies virus, which I'll talk about later, um, uh, genetically encoded indicators of activity that allow us to, you can target those encoders to a particular cell type or circuit, you could um, link connectivity to function, and optogenetic, pharmacogenetic methods for um, manipulation of specific cell types. But all of this depends on the ability to um, restrict gene expression to cell types of interest. So if we wanted to do that in a species that's not transgenic, um, something like a monkey, um, what kind of approaches can we use to do that? And one idea early on was that um, you would be able to use a cell type specific promoter. Some um, part of the DNA that's upstream of the coding sequence of some gene that you know might be in one cell type and not the other. And you would just put that in your viral vector and it would magically work and get you gene expression in your cell type of interest. And it turns out that that doesn't work. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of why um, it doesn't work and then talk about an approach um, that provides some hope for making that at work, which is to, rather than um, having a virus that infects all cells, but only expresses its genetic payload in certain cells, make a virus that will only infect certain cells. So that's what this means. Uh, trope is about targeting specific cells. Um, so um, tropism, uh, it turns out all of the viral vectors that people talk about using, injecting in the brain, have some level of tropism. They don't um, uniformly infect all cell types. Um, if you have them at high enough titers, put in enough viral particles, uh, certain ones can infect everybody, but um, they'll still put in more copies in some cells than others. So um, what does that mean? What implications does that have? Can we take advantage of it? So here's um, one of the first <coughs> examples of a paper published where it was shown that it was possible to use a virus to get a gene expression selectively just in excitatory neurons and not in the inhibitory neurons. And in this paper, what they used was a virus called the lentivirus, a particular, um, the lentivirus, the virus that's used is HIV. So the virus causes AIDS. And these are engineered in a way that you put an envelope protein from some other virus on the outer surface of the viral particle. And it's that envelope protein, we'll talk more about those in the context of the rabies virus later, that interacts with receptors on the cell surface and mediates infection. So that virus that was used is a uh, pseudotype with uh, the glycoprotein G from the particular stomatitis virus. Okay. And they used the alpha cam kinase promoter because there had been transgenic mice made with that promoter that looked like they, and alpha cam kinase is only in excitatory cells. And it turned out that this virus with the alpha cam kinase promoter would only express in excitatory neurons. Um, so here, um, uh, here, here's the quantification of that. And this is uh, a later paper in Monkey showing the same thing where this is quantified. So essentially 100% expression in excitatory neurons. But as I'm going to show you in the um, next couple slides, this isn't just because this excitatory specific promoter presumably 
um, only expresses in excitatory cells. It's a combination of the fact that this virus preferentially infects excitatory cells, and this promoter provide, provides some additional bias. Okay. So um, here, if we now, rather than using the alpha cam kinase promoter, we use a synapsin promoter, which expresses only in neurons, but is not specific for any particular cell types. And now we're using uh, a virus that expresses GFP, uh, lentivirus in this case, the same one as you saw in the previous slide. We're doing this in a mouse line where only uh, inhibitory neurons express GFP, and that makes it very easy to quantify using a virus that expresses a red fluorescent protein, what percentage are double labeled. And what you see is just the lentivirus with this promoter all by itself will give you 95% excitatory neurons. So you don't need any specific promoter to get a very strong bias of this virus because 80% of the neurons are excitatory. We've gone all the way up to 95%. But if we do add um, the alpha campaigns promoter in that virus, as you saw in the previous slide, that would go up to 100%, so it provides an additional bias. We can show you that the alpha campanus promoter by itself doesn't work because if we use a different virus, AAV, that will only give 25% excitatory neurons um, and add the alpha campanus promoter, we can boost it way up to 80% excitatory, but um, not 100%. Yeah? Um, how much of what you're showing us now is sitting on the cord? What about the um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because the tropism of these, the, the question of how much is, of what I'm showing is specific for, for the cortex. I think the, the basic principles here would generalize to any brain area, any virus you would look at, is that any virus you would use has, is going to have tropism for certain types of cells in whatever structure you look at. But um, these don't even necessarily, um, aren't conserved even across species. So um, if we use a particular serotype of AAB, in a mouse, we see different results than what we see in monkeys. Monkeys, we see very interesting laminar patterns that some viruses will only infect you know, layer 4A and layer 6, or others layer 4C and others layer 2, 3. Um, things like that we tend to see much less in, in mice, where we see that the viruses are less specific. But we've seen uh, viruses like this one that can have a strong bias for inhibitory or excitatory cells. So I think that's something that it, you know, there hasn't been as much of this done in other structures, but I think you would generally see that if you actually look for it. Um, and uh, in, in general, what people do is they try to find something that works, and they don't really explore why it works. You're just satisfied that you made a virus with a particular promoter, and it gave you the result you wanted that it expressed in the red cell types in the right area, and they don't go. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about tropism, and, um, and unfortunately then what I just told you means that if you would like to say, I'd like to make a virus that's going to express only in a particular cell type, in a particular brain region, you're, you probably don't have a really rational approach for doing that. You're going to have to test a lot of different viruses, find one that might have some bias, maybe you can find some uh, sequence of DNA that will add an additional transcriptional bias, but it's going to be a lot of trial and error. Um, so what you'd like to have is something that is more predictable. And um, one approach that um, I'm going to talk about is what I'll call engineered tropism. That is to um, change the tropism of a virus, engineer it, so that it will infect cells of interest, like you see in this slide. And the particular um, uh, cell type we well, the approach that we use is to um, take advantage of the fact that different um, types of neurons have different re uh, uh, receptors on their surface. And in the case of this particular receptor called PERB-B4, it's only expressed in inhibitory neurons in the cortex. Okay. PERB-B4 is a receptor that um, it interacts with a genetically encodable ligand so that means that we can um, build a uh, ligand that is an artificial ligand that links together neregulin, the, the uh, ligand for ERB4, and a different um, receptor from a virus 
called TVB. Okay? So if we make this bridge protein, we'll call it the TVB neuregulin bridge protein, we would hope that then this would bind to the ERB4 receptor and present this TVB ligand on the cell surface. So if it were here, um, we'd do that. And TVB is a ligand for an envelope protein that's well known from uh, avian sarcoma leucosis virus. We can pseudotype our virus so that it has that NB on the outside of it. Okay. Uh, we'll talk more about what I mean by pseudotyping and how we do that um, later. But we can make this virus in these experiments. If we just use the rabies virus, um, that then we would hope would selectively infect the cells that have um, this ERB4 receptor on their surface. So you make this virus, you make this bridge protein, you, you mix them together, and then you put it on the cells, and you hope that then that will only infect these ERB4 expressing cells. And then here you can see that that works, where we can show by uh, in situ hybridization these flat spots or the cortical neurons that are expressing ERB4. And here's our anti GFP labeling the virus expressed GFP from its genome. Um, and you can see that there's very good overlap in selectivity. And you can see that just from the morphology of the cells here that are infected, that they're all in inhibitory neurons. Okay. So, this um, basic approach um, has worked well for us. Um, we haven't explored a lot further, a lot of different things. It's something that hasn't been a higher priority for us. As you'll see on Thursday, we've moved a lot toward um, mice. There are also people working on making transgenic monkeys. But that, that is an approach that I think has a lot of promise and probably um, could be explored quite a bit more. Okay. So um, that in the, the last part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about our um, rabies virus tracing method that we've developed. And also, if we have a little time at the end, uh, a newer method related to this. Um, so this is a slide from our first proof of principle paper um, where what you're seeing is a photograph of a cultured brain slice. This is all in vitro in this, this first manuscript um, where all the neurons that are green are expressing green fluorescent protein from a rabies virus that has green fluorescent protein in its genome. So these all were infected with rabies virus. And it turns out that all of these green neurons are infected because they're connected to just one cell here in the center where most of these cells are clustered around that's red. Uh, so this uh, cell is what we call a starter cell. This is one where you, you'll see later how we did this, but we made the rabies virus initially infect only that one cell and then it spread to it and labeled all of these um, other cells that are directly presynaptic to it and then it stopped. So rabies virus is part of its natural life cycle. Normally what it does is it spreads from postsynaptic to presynaptic neurons. It spreads only in the retrograde direction, and it spreads only between neurons that are synaptically connected. So if you had taken a brain slice like this and put rabies virus on it, um, just a normal wild-type rabies virus, it would have indiscriminately infected any neurons that had axons, so, so their receptors for rabies glycoprotein on axon terminals would have been taken up at the axon so the cell body has been expressed, and it would have just kept spreading the whole slice would have been filled with rabies infected cells. But in this case, what we did is we somehow made it so that this rabies virus would only infect that one cell initially, and then after it infected that cell, it would spread just like it normally does, only in the retrograde direction, but after going just one step, it would stop. So how can we do that? How can we build a, a rabies virus which rather than indiscriminately infecting all neurons will only infect that one cell initially and will only spread one step and then stop. Um, so I'm going to um, tell you how we're, we're able to do that in the next several slides. But I just, this is just to point out that you know, since that first paper um, eight, eight years ago now, um, lots and lots of people using this is an updated slide. Um, so it's very common for people to use these approaches and um, there are a lot of sort of different nuances to the way people use them in different cases. So there's not really always a one-size-fits-all solution to, to everything I'm going to show you. Um, so um, good. I thought I was having this slide next. That's why I became a little confused. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to have those other slides. Okay, so I mentioned the idea we want to make the rabies virus be able to do a couple of things that it normally doesn't do. We want it to be able to initially infect the cell types, cells of interest and then spread one synaptic step and then stop. And the key to being able to do that 
is um, that we use a, a rabies virus that has the glycoprotein gene deleted from the, the genome. That's what we mean by G deletion. You'll see in the next slide what I mean by that. And this will allow us to pseudotype the virus, as we've already talked about a bit, that allows us to infect specific cells of interest. And it also um, doesn't prevent the virus from being able to replicate and express its genome at very high levels. So even when you have only a few viral particles spreading from one starter cell to the others, you will detect that. But it also allows us to control the synaptic spread, so it only goes one step and then stop. So um, here is a schematic diagram of a normal rabies virus particle. Uh, here's the genome of the virus, the negative strand RNA virus, and it has only five genes in its genome. One of them is this gene, the glycoprotein gene, which codes for these red spikes on the outside, which are the glycoprotein, the envelope protein, which normally would interact with receptors on axon terminals, so allows uptake at axon terminals. If we delete the glycoprotein gene from the genome and replace it with GFP, we can grow the virus and cells that express the rabies glycoprotein so that it would have, that it would bud out of the cells and have rabies glycoprotein on the envelope and would affect cells through axon terminals. But a virus like this is unable to spread, as I'll show you in the, the next slide. It would just directly infect cells, express DF, go back to the cell body, express DFP, and fill them up and stop. Uh, because the glycoprotein gene is required to make infectious particles that come out of the cell. The other thing we can do is to make viral particles that look like this, that are pseudotyped. They have an envelope protein from a different virus on them that conveys different uh, tropism, different infectious properties. We do that by having a cell line that expresses that envelope protein, in this case, and they. So we infect it with this virus. The viral particles then bud out. And so now they have, uh, on this host cell derived membrane, the, um, the uh, NVA viral protein. Okay. So and we know what the receptor is for NVA. It's TVA, so we can selectively infect cells that have TVA in them. Okay? So then we can use these viruses to do all these different things use it as a retrograde tracer, label inputs to single neurons, label in neuron, input to neurons of a uh, genetically targeted type, um, or because the virus doesn't kill cells Im uh, immediately, you can correlate connectivity with function using this. Okay. So this is just showing if we now take this virus that has the rabies glycoprotein on its envelope, inject it in different places in the brain, like the superior colliculus, look in the cortex, you see just tall tufted layer by pyramidal cells, which is the cell type in the cortex that projects axons for the colliculus. So they're now filled with GFP. And um, so there's just direct infection and no transsynaptic spread because there's no rabies glycoprotein in these cells, so the virus can't spread to say layer two, three neurons that we know make lots of connections to layer five. So this makes a nice retrograde tracer for seeing the morphology of cells that project to a particular place. Um, but what I've said we really want to do is label inputs to single neurons. Um, and uh, how we can do that is going to be illustrated in the next um, several slides. So if you want to label the input to a single neuron in vivo, um, you start out by electroprating DNA into that one cell, because this is inherently a genetic method. And we're going to inject uh, three different plasmids. One is TBA. Remember, that's the receptor for NVA. That's what's going to allow us to selectively infect this cell. The rabies glycoprotein, that's what's going to allow the virus to spread out of this cell. And then just the marker gene so that we can find the cell later. So we electroprate the cell with, with DNA. We wait two or three days. Um, the gene products are expressed, and so now we have TBA on the cell surface and rabies glycoprotein as well. And now if we inject this uh, NVA pseudotype rabies virus, which in this case has a cherry in the genome, um, it will selectively infect just this one cell. If you injected this virus into a normal brain where there are no cells with TBA, it won't infect any cells. There are no endogenous receptors for NVA in the mammalian brain. So we can get selectively in, in selective infection of the one cell. It expresses the um, M. cherry from the genome, so the cell turns red. Now it takes advantage of the rabies glycoprotein that was there and makes rabies viral particles that can infect the axon terminals and spread back up to the directly presynaptic neurons which now express m cherry, um, And now the virus is stuck there. These cells have no rabies glycoprotein. Glycoprotein is required for spread, so it's monosynaptic and restricted spread from a genetically targeted neuron. Okay. And then uh, these are just pictures of, um, in the visual cortex, the starter cell there and some 
cream cells. You can go and look across the brain. Now, don't you expect hundreds and thousands of cells connected? Yeah. So um, and you see only several. Of the yeah. Right? So in this published paper, the number of cells on average that we saw was about 40 or 50 cells, and the so it's far from all of the cells, and we don't know how many there should be. But you um, know how many synapses are. In yeah. The so so if you count the numbers, so this is in. Um, Layer 2-3 of mouse visual cortex. And there are published papers, uh, Golgi staining, counting the number of spines, and there are about 1,200 spines of these cells. If you, um, in published papers, if you find a layer 4 cell that's connected to a layer 2-3 cell, and you fill them with dye, trace the axons, find the synaptic contacts, they always have four or five synaptic contacts. Same thing for layer 2-3 plus five. So you, um, so you, so you divide so 1,200 by four, and you say there are about 300 pieces of yeah, so if you divide 1,200 by 4, you say there should be 300. That would assume, though, that all of the connections that come from everywhere in the brain may be layer 5. We don't know that. Make 4 or 5 synapses. But maybe some of these only make 1. So I think an upper limit would be 1,200. A realistic number might be 5 or 600. I can tell you that there are at least 5 or 600. Because Botan Roska now has gotten much better at this. There are, there are things we've done to make better glycoproteins. They're more efficient. Um, also, um, the timing. Uh, the quality of the preparation and other things. So Botan has seen up to, I think, more than 600 inputs in a single neuron. Um, and his average is somewhere around 300 or 400. Um, yeah, but, but you know, if, 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 you are, if you have this number, do you know whether the person has this number really needed to read the second Yes, it's easy to identify the... the of yeah, yeah. So, so if, if you see... Um, something less than 100%. These are all things that normally come up at the end of questions. So you might as well answer them now. So if you see you're not labeling all the inputs, well then maybe there could be some bias. Only some, some cell types are more efficiently infected than others. I think that because it requires synaptic context to spread, a cell that maybe layer 4 cells always have 4 or 5 connections, but maybe layer 5 cells only have 1 connection, that would mean you have a fourfold greater probability of infecting those cells. So the numbers of synaptic context is probably going to create a bias. Um, there's the possibility that different cell types might have different receptors on their axon terminals that influence the efficiency of spread. Um, also, we've done lots of experiments with wild-type rabies tracing circuits, and we see that the viral particles, if you stain with, antibody, with an antibody for them, initially are in the more proximal dendrites, and they take a little time to spread out. I think that could create a bias as well, although these are always looked at seven to ten days later when we see viral particles throughout the cell, so that might not create as much of a bias. But say a fast spiking inhibitory that makes a cell that makes many, many synapses on the cell body might have a higher probability of being connected. And in our published paper, we saw more inhibitory cells labeled than you would expect from the probability, that from, from the known proportions of connectivity as well as um, the numbers of cells. So there was some bias in our experiment. I don't know about in Botan's now where he has many more cells. You know, if you're getting closer to 100% of the inputs, there's probably much less bias. Okay. So, um, yes. Uh, maybe I'm imagining things, but the red clouds are still around the uh, astrocytes. Yeah. So they also transfect. So, so we see this in some cases, and um, the the so and we only see the these astrocytes uh, that are probably just touching the dendrites of this starter cell, right? Don't see them around these these cells here. If we infect with rabies virus, where there's no glycoprotein, so this. Um, might be the astrocytes making contact with this cell um, that it normally would. We don't always see this, and there might be some immune response. These viruses are detected by the immune system and the innate immunity in the in the nervous system, and that might trigger some changes that cause the changes in the relationship between astrocytes and, and neurons. Or it might be that it just works better in some cases than others to label contacts that are all, already there. Um, so these astrocytes are there. They don't um, interfere with our ability to look at the, the neurons. But the principle that means the rabies can contact the blood. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you take um, a, a rabies virus that has rabies glycoproteins in the envelope and inject it directly into the brain, in addition to infecting neurons through their axon terminals, cells far away, you see a sort of local cloud of some astrocytes that can get infected. So, so astrocytes do have receptors for rabies glycoproteins. Okay. So um, the, the other approach that we and many people now use is to target neurons um, 
in a mouse line that would have uh, Cree in it. So this is a, a way to target a specific cell type, the most common way. Um, and now what we want to do is to essentially get the same genes that we electroporated in the previous example. Uh, we want them now expressed into that whole pop to be expressed in a whole population of cells. The way that we typically do this, and in most published experiments, is to use a helper virus, an AAV or a Lenti virus, that only following Cree recombination will express CDA and the rabies glycoprotein. So that's illustrated with schematic over here, where you would inject a helper virus that um, indiscriminately infects um, all the cells of, of all types, but requires Cree recombination for the TDA and glycoprotein and maybe a marker gene. Um, and so now only the Cree expressing cells have TDA. And now when you inject the invasive attack rabies, it selectively infects those cells and then again spreads only one synaptic step and then stops. Um, and um, I think um, given the time, I'm not going to go into this particular story where um, in collaboration with Anatole Kreiser, we looked at input into different cell types in the stratum. This is all published, but basically it, it works as you'd expect, and you can do nice things like quantify across the entire brain now inputs to a particular uh, cell type. And that's really one of the main advantages of using this, this approach is that unlike other experiments where we could look locally at circuits in a brain flesh, now we can look across the whole brain at the specificity of inputs coming in from more, more distant um, sources and see differences in inputs to, to different um, cell types. Okay. The, the next thing I wanted to highlight is at the start of the talk I mentioned that if you want to use um, tools that allow you to target different cell types or you want to understand how, uh, how neural circuits work, you need to link connectivity to function. And mentioned the idea that, well, if you have Cree lines and cell types, you can use different animals. You can, one animal, say, label the inputs to, to all the cells of a particular type, and a different animal express decamp in those cells and correlate the function of that cell type with some behavior. Um, and you might turn those cells on and off and get another animal and see how that changes behavior or changes the activity of other neurons in the network. But for the, that fine scale specificity I, I talked about, you'd want to do this in, in the same animal because a particular neuron um, is connected uniquely. So we can take advantage of the fact that rabies is a, just like any virus, is a gene delivery tool and we can insert any genes of interest into the rabies virus genome and then <coughs> Um, we've, we've done that and there are many more than, than this now, but you can express genes that allow you to do things like monitor activity or control activity or to even control gene expression in cells if you say think that um, you, you'd like to label a population of cells based on how they're connected and then knock out a gene that you might think is involved in plasticity or subsequent development uh, of connections. Um, and these things then work for the most part like you'd expect um, just because the genetic tools work and the virus will express the genes. So, for example, if you express channel redoxin in cells and record from them, you can stimulate them with light. Um, if you express GCAMP, here we did intrinsic signal optical imaging in mice so we could identify borders between visual areas and inject a um, rabies virus that has rabies glycoprotein on its envelope, express a GCAMP in just red, inject that in area of AL, and then use two photon imaging in the live mouse, there are Z stacks looking down through. You can image these cells in V1 that projected to this area. I would see them all the way down to layer 5. And then present the animal with visual stimuli and make tuning curves that changes in fluorescence with um, uh, drifting gradients moving in different directions. So you can see these tuning curves. So you can correlate the um, connectivity with the function. And um, I guess I've been, I've been mentioning this, but you know, what we wanted to do very early on, and we, we struggled with it more than Boton has, is to, to electroporate a single cell, label all the inputs to it. He's been doing that with GCAMP expressed in the cells like you see here, and uh, been able to functionally characterize um, hundreds of cells that you know all converge onto a single neuron, and uh, to, to better understand how um, uh, a cohort of inputs might um, contribute to function. And you might imagine in the future, um, doing things like having channel redoxin in vivo and even, you know, like playing the piano itself to go and say if you had the inputs to a single neuron, measure the timing of their activity and then um, change the pattern of activity in some way or take just a few cells out of the network and see how it changes the responses of that postsynaptic cell. 
Um, so um, this will only take a couple minutes, so it's, it's a newer thing that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, and since I've already developed the idea of um, fine scale specificity, um, you might appreciate why we might like to have an orthogonal tracing system, much like rabies virus. So in the, in the start of the talk, I talked about how we could use photostimulation, cross-correlation analysis to, to determine whether two cells share a common input. Um, but we could only do that in a brain flash and for local connections. So you might like to know that about long distance inputs, say inputs from the thalamus or cortical cortical connections, whether two neurons that are connected to each other or not connected or different types share common input. Um, and uh, so what, as I'll show in the next slide, to do this we need an orthogonal tracing system and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, you, you might imagine, well, okay, let's use just rabies virus and use rabies virus with glycoprotein deleted, but one that expresses a GFP and one that expresses a red fluorescent protein, and we'll use NV and TBA to get one cell, and uh, NB and TBB for the other to target the cells. So we'll get the green virus in this cell, the red one in this cell, and then we'll have monosynaptically restricted tracing of the inputs. Um, and so the, the green cell inputs will be green, the red red, and the common inputs will have both. Um, and that's fine as long as these two cells are not connected to each other. But if these two cells are connected to each other, it all blows up on you because the red virus spreads to the green cell, the green to the red cell, and they're both complemented by the same lipoprotein, the rabies lipoprotein. So now the red virus spreads to uh, the green virus that came from here to the red cell goes to all of its inputs, and so you now have no idea who was connected to which cell. Everybody expresses both colors. Okay? So what you need is a system where you use some other kind of virus that's orthogonal, that's complemented by some other gene that's deleted. And that's what we've done with the Sendai virus, is to build a different kind of virus, a Sendai virus, that's complemented with a different glycoprotein. Sendai virus, like rabies virus, is a negative strand RNA virus. There, we use a version that has the glycoprotein genes deleted from its genome. Uh, but Sendai virus normally wouldn't spread these way neurons. I've already introduced the idea of pseudotyping. Well, we can pseudotype Sendai virus with rabies glycoprotein. Well, you might wonder, well, how good okay, is that going to do you? It'll get you a retrograde spread, but how is it going to be orthogonal? Well, the way it can be orthogonal is that when these viruses bud out of those cells that I showed you a picture of growing in them, the core of the virus interacts with the intracellular part of the glycoprotein. So the Sendai virus core will interact with the cytoplasmic tail of its own glycoprotein, but hopefully not with the cytoplasmic tail from rabies glycoprotein. So what we can do is to build a chimeric glycoprotein that has the Sendai virus tail, which will hopefully allow us to package this chimeric glycoprotein uh, into a Sendai virus, but we'll have the rabies glycoprotein part on the outside, which will hopefully allow it to spread between neurons um, and spread from postsynaptic to presynaptic cells. And then you would have your chimeric glycoprotein, which hopefully will work in the, to package Sendai virus, but not rabies virus, and then hopefully your rabies glycoprotein will um, work for rabies, we know it already does, but won't package the Sendai virus. And that's what's shown in this slide in culture experiments where the starter cells express um, either the chimeric glycoprotein or the rabies glycoprotein and are infected either with the Sendai virus or the rabies virus or here the Sendai virus and cells that are starter cells that express the TBA which will allow the NV pseudotype virus to infect the cells are red and cells that are green but not red are cells where the virus spread from those starter cells to um, other cells in the culture, presumably retrograde transsynaptic. We haven't proven that here, so we'll just call it transneuronal. So what you see here is that you only see the spread in this case and not in these two other cases. This is the case where we use the chimeric glycoprotein with the Sendai virus. Here, where we have the chimeric glycoprotein and rabies virus, there's no spread. So that, that works, it's orthogonal. And here, where we have rabies glycoprotein uh, and Sendai virus, it also doesn't work. So these two systems are completely orthogonal to each other and work. So we're now in the process of, um, it turns out that when we started doing this, the virus we used, what we could get, had a temperature sensitive protein in it, so it won't work in vivo, and we've had to go back and re-engineer this all from scratch um, to, to now 
um, pursue this approach in vivo and we're finally getting uh, close to that. So that's where we are with that. Um, so I will just end there and leave you with a slide of people who did all of the work in the lab over many years. Thank you. Because 
in many cases, now spiders that you might have, like right now, one cell type that, that people have been focusing on are VIP cells. Well, it turns out VIP cells are probably at least three or four different cell types, and they've all been lumped together. And we're doing a lot of experiments in my lab trying to tease those apart better uh, using additional um, differences in gene expression and intersectional approaches that we can see from the part genetically. But you're also alluding to, to this idea that, I mean, sometimes there might even be a continuum of things like, like gene expression and firing patterns across cells that you might never be able to get a genetic way to, to target those cells that might fire differently. And even the same cell might change its <coughs> properties over time. So those are all things that, you know, we're going to have to deal with. When we, I think we got fairly far with thinking of brain areas interacting and knowing something about how the brain works. And for now, this is what we can do. And in the future, you've got to, got to worry about that and think about how those things affect it. And maybe, you know, one thing you have to do is to find out to what extent it is an issue. And you can maybe express genes in these cell types and then stick electrodes on them all and target them and see how much variability right. there is. And see, maybe for some mouse lines and some cell types it's a problem and others it's not. So it's just, you know, so yeah, it's, a, it's a problem you have to think about and worry about. Yeah. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for this beautiful talk. Uh, I was wondering, one of the biggest problems in the rabies that uh, most of the is that people get the rabies virus. Yeah. And I wonder, um, first, what, what causes the cell that is by the rabies? And second, do we have any hopes on using rabies that is not toxic for the cell? Yeah. yeah, so, um, my thinking on this has actually just in the last few weeks been changing because of a paper that I had missed that was published a couple years ago. So I'm no longer convinced that the rabies is killing the cells, and I realize the experiments that we've done have not ruled out an alternative possibility, which is that the rabies stops expressing its genes or gets cleared from the cells. Okay. So um, what we've done to, to to look at this is we infect cells with the G-deleted rabies and it expresses green fluorescent protein and we go and look at and we count um, at different time points how many cells are still left and we do this in a whole bunch of animals to try to reduce variability as much as possible and what we see is after about 14 days 80-90% of the cells are gone, no longer green. Okay. Um, and I've been assuming that the, the cells are killed. Um, and we've done all kinds of things changing making mutations to M, other proteins, effects on gene expression. And no matter what we do, we, we, can, we might extend that for a day or two. Um, and the, the, what I've been thinking happens uh, for many years is that there's an immune system is activated and triggers apoptosis in the cells die. And we've even made versions of the virus that express genes that block the genes for innate immunity. And those didn't help. Um, this paper I just finally should have seen long ago, um, published a couple of years ago, used a rabies virus, SADB19 strain, vaccine strain, intact, like a protein gene. It can spread throughout the nervous system. And they were following up on reports that if you look at postmortem histology of people or animals that die from rabies, you don't see that cells are dead all over the place like you'd expect, even though you see rabies virus all over the brain. Um, so what they did is they made it a rabies virus that expressed pre-recombinates. And they used this in a mouse line that when it expresses, when a cell expresses pre, it turns the cell from red to green, or green to red, I forget which, but it changes the color of the fluorescent protein. The cell. So you can mark the cell that's been infected with rabies. And what they saw is they could look two, three months later, and actually what they saw was that the numbers of cells in the brain that had been infected with rabies and were still alive kept increasing because the rabies was spreading through the brain which is the opposite of what you expect if they're all dying when afterward. And so these cells have been infected with rabies and you see them three months later. So this suggests that um, the rabies virus either stops turning off its genes or the virus, the viral particles are cleared from the cell. And the, the experiment they did, the antibody staining for components of the rabies virus that are produced from its genome, so they can't distinguish it between the two. So we're planning now to do experiments where we take our virus we have a version that expresses Cre, um, and we can put this in a mouse plane where cells express TD tomato, red fluorescent protein afterward, and we can use two-photon imaging and just look at the same cells over time so we'll just directly affect them and watch them over time. We'll make also a version that has red fluorescent protein instead of green, 
and do that in mice that have GCAM expression, and we <coughs> just measure the cell functionally over time and see if their visual responses change things like that. So I hope to be able to answer that question much better. Uh, if you asked me that a month ago, I would have said, you know, they just die after 14 days. They, you know, they look pretty healthy up to about 10 days, then they get to be hard to record from. But um, might be they survive longer, and maybe they're unhealthy for a while, and maybe they get better. I don't know. So, uh, but there may be a lot of hope for this that it might not actually be as bad as we thought if we just use pre recombination to permanently mark the cell that we're infected. So why does the animal die? Um, yeah. So so it must <laughs> must be bad eventually, right? And so um, it might change the function of the cell. These are things we, we just don't know. But um, as you know, the, the life cycle of this is that it changes the animal's behavior ultimately. They become hydro hydrophobic, their behavior changes the way they're more likely to bite other animals, and the virus spreads from, from the saliva into the other animals that they bite. So this might be part of the life cycle is that if the virus killed neurons too quickly, or killed too many of them, that the animal would be dead before it could then change its behavior and spread the virus to that animal. So it might have evolved some mechanism whereby it evades the immune system in some way. Um, but I really don't know. It could be that half the cells will die. You know, if we, you know the, the, the study I told you about, they're just seeing that more cells increase, but they're not following the same cells over time to see what percentage die. So it could be half the cells die, it could be 80% die, it might be they all live, I don't know. So we'll do that experiment and find out. More questions? Okay, thank you, Ed.